Yeah. Welcome back. Um, in this video, we're going to talk with uh, uh, with Aviva, who's going to introduce herself. Aviva is a new member of our supervisory staff, and uh, we're happy to have all of you get to meet her. Aviva, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. <coughs> Hi. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Aviva Zahaviasa. Um, I actually trained at the Family Institute many years ago. Um, I was a licensed clinical social worker in California and in Israel I'm a certified couples and family therapist and supervisor and I work in several different places. Um, I'm now supervising at the Family Institute but I also work at a government clinic for adolescents. Okay. Other places. Good. So Aviva is uh, very experienced with adolescents and we're happy to have her uh, join us. What we want to talk about the, tonight, Aviva, is uh, we're going to sort of think out loud about uh, differentiation and development in times of crisis. So here we have um, families with uh, adolescent girls living through this particular period, and uh, um, we want to think in general and then try to think uh, more specifically about Haredi families and what, uh, what this current crisis is going to, uh, uh, how it's going to impact on, uh, um, on these families and these girls. So uh, let's start with your thoughts. Well, one of the things that I've been thinking about is um, whenever there's any kind of external crisis in families, the impact it has on adolescents. And when I think about adolescent girls, what I'm thinking about is that oftentimes they maybe take on more responsibility in their family, um, either to protect their parents, um, or they take on more responsibilities in terms of you know, taking care of their younger siblings, helping around the house. And oftentimes that comes at the expense of really the developmental kinds of you know, milestones that they need to be working on at that particular developmental stage, which is usually more separation, differentiation, you know, trying to find their own voice, trying to figure out who they are in comparison to their family. And oftentimes the external crisis kind of pulls them back in into a lower uh, or a previous developmental stage. It doesn't really allow them to kind of move forward with the things they need to be focusing on. And right. I think in particular when I think about, um, you know, Haredi adolescent girls, one of the things that comes to mind is, you know, oftentimes the things that are that they're you know focusing on other than the normal adolescent type things which is you know their social life and you know friends school you know whatever is you know oftentimes they're already starting to think about getting married and so much of the focus is on that next developmental stage and when there's so much stress and chaos happening around whether it's something like we're dealing with now like the coronavirus or other kinds of stressors, whether it's family stressors or other types of things, I think it makes it very hard for them to focus on themselves and the kind of internal work they need to be doing to prepare themselves for those developmental milestones. Right, so if we uh, connect this, as I'm gonna be trying to do more and more over time, to um, how we think about differentiation and uh, adolescence, um, so, um, we could say that there's a certain danger that by becoming drafted into helping the family to survive, you know, a bunch of kids and an adolescent girl is like a second mother and she's going to get drafted into all sorts of, uh, uh, all sorts of uh, um, responsibilities, which one assumes she both wants to succeed in doing. And uh, also there's a certain trade-off. So she's going to have a complex experience. In other words, let's say you take a 16-year-old girl who's busy taking care of the younger kids a lot of the day and may not have time for her friends. That's the kind of uh, trade-off that you would see. Uh, what we would like to think about is not so much is it good or is it bad, but how that experience that she has, which is complex and has some contradictions to it, has some uh, complexity to it, how that experience can become appreciated within the conversation between the adolescent girl and her uh, mother and father. We'll start with her mother. Um, so that there would be a kind of a, a dialogue where something new would happen. You know, when we think about 
rise, raising the level of differentiation. It would be where people are able to say something new to each other that they haven't heard before. And it's not, a, a, the issue is not a power struggle. Don't let me, don't make me take care of the kids. The issue is what it's like for me, how it's like for me and what else I have in mind. And if mother and the daughter can speak about those experiences and the mother can hear a 16 year old different than she heard a 14 year old or a 12 year old, then there's a new, uh, a new dialogue. And the new dialogue is a co-creation as we, we talk about it. And uh, of course the danger is that if the family's overwhelmed, the mother might say, look, I don't have time or energy to think about it, just take care of the kids and uh, I, I don't have time to think about your experience, then you would go into a, a situation of regulation. You know, just do the job. It doesn't matter what your experience subjectively is. And then the kind of communication would be about regulation and not about intersubjectivity. And the level of differentiation would, uh, um, would, would, would diminish. Right. I, mean, I work with a lot of parents too. And I think it's very hard sometimes for parents to validate what their kids are feeling because somehow they feel like if they validate, let's say in this situation where you're describing, if let's say a mother was validating how hard it was for her daughter in this particular situation with increased expectations and you know whatever, sometimes parents think, well, then somehow I'm letting them off the hook or sometimes I'm legitimizing, you know, um, not them not having to do things that I'm expecting them to do. And, you know, oftentimes as therapists, we need to help parents understand that by validating feelings, it doesn't mean you don't expect your child to do what's being asked of them, but by giving room for what the internal experience is, you know, a whole new kind of conversation can happen between the parent and the child. And also the teenager often experiences things very differently after that. I'm glad you used the word validation because I think that uh, that often confuses parents. In other words, uh, um, it may not be a power struggle of either you're going to get up and take care of the children or you're not, <clears throat> but there's sort of a, um, a power struggle, a struggle not in the realm. People who have taken my course know that I like to think that there were three realms where, uh, um, where emotional discussion takes place. And usually one of them is more dominant than another at different times with different people. And uh, one of those realms is control. One of those realms is um, self-respect. And one of those realms is closeness. So when we talk about validation, we're actually going from do it or don't do it, which is control, to self-respect. And uh, there, I think parents sometimes, their own self-respect is on the line. In other words, let's say a girl uh, says to her mother, I'm tired, this is hard for me, right? And now let's say the mother feels, uh-oh, that means I'm a failure as a mother. Either she's a failure as a daughter <clears throat> or I'm a failure as a mother. How, how can we as family therapists help them to create a dialogue where they feel that by having the dialogue, they're succeeding as a daughter and a, and a mother? Right. So, I mean, in terms of my work with parents, oftentimes as therapists, I think we first have to validate the parents' experience in order for the parents to be emotionally available to their children, it doesn't matter what age their kids are, meaning that, that oftentimes you know, the work with the parents is so critical in terms of them being able to take that step towards their, towards their, their child or their adolescent, and we oftentimes are the key to that. Meaning if we can be empathic towards the parents' experience, then they can really be empathic towards their, towards their children. Right. Uh, and, you know, oftentimes parents are so burdened and so overwhelmed that they never hear from anybody, you know, any kind of validation of what they're experiencing. Um, That's a crucial thing, right? Now, where would a parent feel the validation? Where would they feel it? Right. Is that what you're saying? Well, where, do parent, where does a mother get her sense of validation? That I'm getting, I'm uh, I'm the responsible adult here at home, and I'm getting us through this pretty well. Uh, well, some parents, I think, um, mistakenly think that if their children behave or you know carry out whatever the expectations are, then that means that they're a good parent. Right. Versus recognizing that their kids are independent, 
people and are going to do what they're going to do. And it's not necessarily a direct reflection on who they are as parents. So like part of the work with parents is definitely helping them make that separation between, okay, I'm doing the best I can as a parent. I'm not always going to be able to predict what the consequences are because my kids are their own people and they're going to do what they're going to do. And so helping the parent make that distinction, like have they done their hishtadlut and they've done everything they can, then at that point they kind of have to let go and say, I can't control my child, meaning a lot of the work with parents is around that, and especially parents of teenagers. Right. So in other words, uh, you would be thinking about a mother who um, might be thinking that to be a good mother means that her daughter shuts up and does takes care of the kids, so she's a good girl. Uh, that would be more regulation. Uh, and as family therapists, we would try to encourage her uh, to think in a somewhat different way. In other words, to think a bit more about how am I doing in helping this girl develop as who she is, which means that her mother appreciates who, if her name is Abigail. So this Abigail-ness, you know, the way that Abigail does this, the way that Abigail does that, some of it better, some of it perhaps uh, different, and uh, to appreciate uh, the way Abigail is, that's a different dialogue, right? And that, that was there. If the mother sees that that's her role, then she can validate that role. Um, now, there's some other people in the family around the mother. The mother, you know, uh, um, especially in a big family, she doesn't have to only validate herself, right? Where else would okay. it come from? Well, the first person is the spouse, the husband, meaning that's, you know. And, and some families, right? Let's talk families. about the spouse first, yeah. Right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, oftentimes when you see conflict, let's say, between one parent and an adolescent, uh -huh. you know, I, I always immediately go to what's happening within the marital relationship and what kind of support or lack of it is going on there. Because when you say par marital relation, but you're talking about if, you know, I'm just pulling back to some of the stuff we've been doing in my course, we're talking mm -hmm. about a particular subsystem, which is the executive subsystem, not necessarily the spouse subsystem. In other words, you want to see validation, not just in the husband, you know, caressing his wife, which is the spouse subsystem, but it is recognizing what she's doing as a parent with her daughter, let's say. Uh, right. so it could be we don't want to you know confuse sometimes parents come in they're afraid but you, know, you want to start hacking you're trying to hear about my marriage but it's right. the parental subsystem that we want to uh, to look at go right. on right no so i mean oftentimes i think you know you can focus even just on the parenting piece and help you know spouses really support each other in terms of the parenting piece and you know that has all kinds of implications in all kinds of directions even if you don't you know, delve deeper into what's going on in the marital relationship. But I mean, you know, I always say to parents, part of your job as spouses is to support each other in parenting. So let's see how, you know, what needs to happen in order for that to happen in your relationship and how can you each support, your, support each other in your parenting when, you know, when things are difficult. And this, I think, comes up like a lot during adolescence because there's so many changes happening you know, with the adolescent and with the relationship between the adolescent and the parents. And, um, you know, oftentimes if parents are working together and supporting each other, then the, the stress in general goes down and the whole mm -hmm. system kind of just calms down. So um, let me just pick up one line here and see, see where we take it. You know, if we want to enter the 21st century, um, we want to... Um, add to what might have been said in the 20th century. The 20th century speak about adolescence was, what do you mean that her mother is helping her to grow up? The only thing her mother can do to help her to grow up is shut her mouth and let her grow up. Mothers don't help girls to grow up. They let them grow up by leaving them alone because girls don't want, or adolescents don't want parents. They want to be free of parents. That was 20th century speak. And uh, yeah. I think we're, we're developing the <laughs> century speak. Well, how would you put it? No, I think adolescents very much need their parents. They need them in a very different way than maybe they needed them when they were younger. But the fact that, you know, if parents disappear during adolescence, it's a complete disaster for their children. 
meaning and you know a lot of the work with parents is really helping them understand that their presence is critical but it means that they're going to have to most likely shift you know the parenting role and do something different but for sure they should not disappear and they should not you know exit their children's lives the absolute opposite <laughs> right but if there's the idea of giving a kid some more room or some more independence doesn't mean cutting them off and saying you're you're an adult you're on the way to being an adult, you're an adolescent. So you know, I'm actually helping you to become an adult and that's a dialogue. Um, um, we'll get back to that. Let, let's, we, we talked about the, the role that the husband might have, the spouse, in helping mother to appreciate what her role is. And some, sometimes what we do in family therapy is we say to people, what's your role? You know, what, 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 if you wanna keep your eye on the ball, what's the ball? The ball is that she takes care of the kids, or the ball is that in the middle of taking care of the kids, uh, that she is developing, that she's becoming an adult. Is that the ball? So if you, if you change the focus, uh, sometimes that helps parents to say, okay, well, she did a lousy job taking care of the kids, but she's doing a good job of becoming herself, so we'll figure it out. Um, now, uh, so the spouse has a certain role, um, and um, what about mothers, sisters, mothers, mother? What, where would we look at the extended family? You know, because one of the advantages of doing family therapy with the uh, Haredi community is that you don't have to live with the isolated nuclear family, which declared itself in the 20th century as normal living in the other okay. century. Um, okay. So, would we want to talk with mom about what she gets from her mother? or perhaps her older sisters. Right. Um, I mean, look, I think in general, looking at kind of a map of the entire extended family is something that's very, very helpful also because sometimes there's a lot of resources in the extended family that oftentimes therapists, especially I think therapists who are trained more from you know, solely working with individuals, aren't so aware of. Meaning that external support system, all those other relatives that could be there to turn to, either that the mother can turn to or that the daughter can turn to, um, can oftentimes relieve a lot of stress, you know, and, and can really help, in, especially in crisis situations. And, you know, when you only got the nuclear family and, you know, today we have even, you know, less situations, fewer situations of just, you know, the typical nuclear family of mother, father, and children. We have more and more divorce rates. And so, you know, oftentimes we're dealing with single parent families. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, the people are living oftentimes in, in isolation and not with a lot of those support systems. And that makes it much more difficult to raise children and much more difficult to, to deal with a lot of these unexpected stresses that, you know, come, that happen without, that are unexpected. So, you know, uh, for those of you who are just seeing your first live family or, you know, doing an intake and, you know, scribbling down all the um, people in the extended family, uh, don't forget that you're mapping resources. That's what Aviv is uh, pointing out. That when it's a lot of times what we do when we look at the extended family, we look back and say, who screwed who up? In other words, who, who, who was the problem and where were the triangles and what's the matter? with them in the past and how do we get to this mess now? And that's only part of the story. And a great deal of the story, when you're going forward, when you're trying to help the family to heal, is to look at the resources. So we would, you know, if we're seeing a family now in the middle of a corona crisis, and we say to ourselves, do we know who mom picks up the phone and calls when she's had it? Who does she call? And it might be this sister, and it might be that sister, and it might be her aunt, and it might be her mother. But uh, we would like uh, to hear what she hears, you see, because when you're talking about validation, so there's the voice of the spouse, and we, you know, we could fiddle with that because they're in the room and they're part of the family. But it'd be very important to hear how your mom thinks you're doing. How does she think about your role? Now, we're used to thinking, oh, how bad was it when, you know, your mother was messing you up? That's only part of the story. Uh, the next part of the story is, much, is she part of the solution? Can you let your hair down? Can you say, oh, it's hard for me with this adolescent girl? And so if we map who the supports are, that actually puts a lot less stress on the 
spouse system also, as long as it isn't, you know, calling your sister to bellyache again about your husband. But if it's just to talk about your experience, then uh, the spouse may feel that's, it works well. He calls his brother or he calls his uncle. And so seeing the whole, uh, the whole map, when we talk about validation, in other words, how mom is feeling about how she's doing with her role, so we want to hear what voices she hears. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right on that. I think that oftentimes, you know, when we're doing a genogram of a family, it's always, okay, where are the problems? But we oftentimes really forget to look at where are the support systems? And in this day and age, I think that's so critical. And especially in these days, <laughs> everybody right. needs to uh, use their support system to the hilt to make yeah. things work. And, you know, there's noise on the internet naturally saying that, you know, God sent us this virus to have us discover our supports. You know, now we're going to find out who are the folks that really uh, help us and um, do some, you know, interesting conversations there. But those conversations, we want to sort of, we want to sort of listen in and say, oh, and when you talk to your sister and, you know, mom says, well, I always call my older sister. That's interesting. And if we leave it there, we sort of imagine, but it's never what you imagine. In other words, so we would want to say, and what does your sister say? And how do you feel when your sister says this as opposed to that? For example, are you in competition with your sister? You, um, is your sister only supportive? Is she also, you know, what does she think about the role of raising kids? And I think we'll probably hear a very, very uh, uh, complex array of voices. Right. You know, I also think when people are dealing with all kinds of challenging situations, you know, the ones who seem to be able to do a better job of raising their kids, whether it's divorce, death, unemployment, the coronavirus, whatever it is, are those who do have supportive families of origin that they can turn to. I mean, right. they're, not, they're not completely alone. Um, right. It also yeah. might be part of mom's validating herself if we find out who she's supporting, who calls her. You know, a lot of times we see our clients and we say, oh, you know, they're the ones who are up Soros. And so everybody's helping them. And a lot of times their self-respect comes from who they're helping. And perhaps it's been a lifelong proposition of maybe mommy's been helping her younger sister and uh, mm -hmm. how she thinks about her younger sister also tells us some interesting things about how she thinks about her daughter taking care of her younger siblings. Right, absolutely, absolutely. I think that, you know, oftentimes, you know, when we're seeing our clients for one hour a week and oftentimes we're seeing them at their most vulnerable and, you know, where they're dealing with the most difficult challenges and, and they bring that to us. They say, here I am, a schlepper. And we sometimes right. believe it, right? Right. And we don't see them the rest of the week. We don't see them functioning. We don't see them doing everything that they're doing. And I think, you know, part of our job as therapists is to, to help highlight that because oftentimes they're not even giving room for that. And um, it can make a, it can have a profound impact, you know, on clients for them to be hearing sometimes for the first time from anybody. You know, wow, you're doing all of that. Wow, you know, like nobody's really given them credit for it. No one's highlighted it. And here, the therapist is really, you know, pointing right. these things out. Well, actually, if, if we put a, a magnifying glass on what you just said now, um, which I think is very, very valuable, you see, you could see that as content, right? In other words, mom presents herself as A, and we say, no, you could be B, and B is better than A, something like that. But actually, it's also a very, very deep process because mom comes in looking at herself as A. And before we get to B, she's convinced that she's A. In other words, we have a subjective picture in our mind of the, the mother, let's say, as failing, as lost, as this or that. And then as we listen, we start to hear something different. So a change takes place in our mind, in our heart. We start to see her in a different way which means that we're part of a co-creation with her. See what I mean? In other words, it's not just that she says A and I say, no, try B. I had to go from A to B. 
and I'm going from A to B face to face with her. So she's having an experience of another human being in deep communication who is moving with her. In other words, we're hearing her and something happens to us and then we bring that to her. So it's not just the content, it's actually a process that happens in the room. Does that sound right? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when we're dealing with many of our clients, you know, and some of some of our clients who've been through pretty horrendous things in their lives, you know, I think that when we can really highlight the fact that not only are there are they survivors in many ways, but they they're a lot more than survivors. I mean, like you know, oftentimes I sit with clients and I think, wow, if I was in their shoes, would I be coping as well? Right. You know, because some of the challenges that some of our clients face are so huge. I mean, really, like, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that for them to hear from another person, you know, like an admiration for the, the, the their ability to get through difficult times and, and really to, you know, to show them that they, that they really have, you know, been able to to weather difficult times right. even if, even if they're in the midst of something now i think that helps put everything into perspective right i suppose this comes up in supervision too right in other words a, uh, if the client is uh, feeling that they're failing it's pretty likely that their therapist if they're in training and pretty new at it is going to come to the supervisor and say i'm failing so there'll be parallel process and then what happens in supervision, which is not just content, but also process, is that first of all, the supervisor feels, oh, oh are you failing? You know, because, you know, we have X number of decades and they have X number of minutes. And so we see all, and then we start to see them differently. We start to see some sort of a process where they're not just failing, that they're actually bringing uh, um, another side of it as well. So we enter into a co-creation in the supervisory process. And then in that context of experiencing a co-creation, that the supervisor starts to see them differently, which means that the supervisor has to allow themselves the room to see them pretty badly in order to make a move. Otherwise, you know, you're just sort of plastic. So something happens in the room and it's co-created. And then that therapist can go back to the client and believe in the process of co-creation. No one said it. You know, talking about co-creation is outside of the co-creation. That's what Buber said, actually. That when you're in it, you're in it. You're not thinking about it. You're doing it. So um, I'm just reminding my students what they heard in class. So, um, so, but then when you've been there with your supervisor, then it comes back to uh, um, uh, the supervision to, to the therapy room, and you're more able to engage in a co-creation. Start to s- not just to give the content, you're, you're really a good parent, but I am moving with you in seeing you as a good parent. So we have created something. And sometimes if we're talking to the mother, that would allow the mother to start to see herself as, a, uh, as different and co-create with her adolescent girl. And if we're seeing the girl, it might give her the experience of a process where things can happen, you know, that it's worth beginning a conversation with mom when you don't know where it's going to go. You know what I mean? So it's a, you, you can say to mom, oh, I'm tired, instead of saying, give me support. Because I don't know if I'm going to get support or not. But me, right now, I'm tired. You know, and if you can bring that and create together, mom may first feel, oh, God, what a schlepper you are. And then start to feel something change in her. I said, of course you're tired. If I were in your shoes, I remember, or I would be, whatever. Then they create together. And so the therapy process and even the supervision process is all part of the same uh, um, uh, issue of making a conversation that becomes appropriation, that raises the differentiation in the family. Right. And one of the things that um, I, I think I read, but I think I also have kind of paid attention to in terms of the Haredi community is that oftentimes the differentiation doesn't happen until let's say the young, is young it like often the, the differentiation what the differentiation oftentimes maybe doesn't happen until let's say the young woman gets married and maybe only after she has children meaning I think oftentimes it doesn't necessarily happen in adolescence 
Mm -hmm. And that oftentimes it gets delayed by a number of years. Um, mm -hmm. And it sometimes takes, you know, let's say maybe into their 20s before they begin more of that separation, you know, differentiation process from their family of origin when they've already become mothers themselves and, you know, are maybe deciding that things are going to be different in their own family versus how they grew up. And so, you know, I think that piece is kind of interesting in terms of what happens with adolescent girls within Haredi families, because it might be a very different kind of experience than with, you know, outside of the Haredi community. Right. Well, well let, let me uh, raise a developmental issue and see how you think about it. Um, and the uh, turn from the 20th to the 21st century in the 90s, there was a series of five books about adolescent girls that Carol Gilligan and her colleagues put out. Uh, for some reason, they're not very well known in Israel. None of them have been translated, but we read English. Um, and um, th the main point of it was that um, girls um, have a developmental process that goes on um, where they're at risk for um, trading in a real relationship for a pseudo relationship. This basic idea is that, you know, an eight-year-old girl knows what she thinks, fights with her friends about what she thinks. She doesn't give up what she thinks. But when you see that girl at 12 or 13, she may sort of say, oh, it doesn't matter what I think. The main thing is that everybody gets along. And so she sort of loses her uh, voice. There was uh, one example is uh, in, in one of the books is a girl called Laura who um, the uh, Gilligan's group used Aesop's fables as a way of uh, understanding how kids think. It's a very good way to do it. So there's a famous fable about, uh, it sounds like the Middle East, but it's uh, a fable uh, from Greece about uh, a mole that shows up at the um, cave of, uh, a por I'm sorry, a porcupine that shows up in, at, in the mole, at, at, at the cave of a mole, hedgehog, and um, says, uh, it's cold outside, can I come in? So the hedgehogs are nice, and they say, yeah, come in. So the porcupine comes in, every time he turns, somebody else is bleeding. So at one point they say to the porcupine, look, this isn't working, you gotta go. And the porcupine says, it's cold. And that's the end of the fable. So then they ask the girls, what do you think? So Laura, when she was eight, said, well, I think the porcupine should roll over and stick his, uh, his quills in the ground. <laughs> a good eight-year-old solution, right? It doesn't solve everything, but it solves that. So it was, it was an opinion. They asked the same girl at 11, what do you think you should do? And the girl said, I don't know what a porcupine looks like. Same girl. So that's the sort of uh, uh, danger that you have, that um, uh, girls, including Haredi girls, and perhaps <clears throat> particularly Haredi girls, lose their voice, lose their voice. And uh, what, what Carol Gilligan was suggesting, and it, the book is called Meeting at the Crossroads, because as you remember, Oedipus killed his father at the crossroads. <laughs> that's a bad solution. And the idea was that women and their daughters can meet at the crossroads, the crossroads of development, and that mothers are capable of helping the daughters not to lose their voice. So now, and that that may be the most important developmental uh, um, uh, enhancement that a mother can give to her daughters to help her not to lose her voice, which means don't lose track of what it's like to be Avigail. Only you know it's unique and so forth. And uh, um, that's where we're talking about this sort of a um, um, uh, um, co-creation because okay. Abigail becomes more Abigail when her mother is interested in what it's like to be Abigail and more probably with her mother than anybody else. And, right. you know, that may be kind of hidden in the Haredi community. In other words, you may not see it. What do you think? Well, I think, I think that that's very true, but I think that that's very dependent on the mother having her voice. <laughs> I don't think that the mother can help her daughter find her voice unless she herself has found her own voice. Right, I mean, and she, she may have given it up. Yeah, I mean, those things are very, very connected. Or she may have given it up during adolescence, but found it again once she's married and have children, but maybe forgot what it was like to be an adolescent, or maybe 
feels like during adolescence, girls shouldn't have a voice. And so she can't be available to her daughter in that way in order to help her daughter find her voice because maybe she wasn't able to do it at that stage in her life or maybe it's not socially accepted or all kinds of different reasons. Um, and, you know, that's why oftentimes the work with parents is so critical because, right. because you can't help your child do something that you haven't done for yourself. But you raised something interesting, which um, I had never thought about before, which is that the adolescent uh, girls and young women, that they become more differentiated when they build their own home. In other words, they don't do it at home with their mother. They do it later, but they did it. So then when they have their own adolescence at home, they have an interesting paradox because if they recall what it was like for themselves to be an adolescent, then they don't do it right? because they didn't do it, but they've already done it. So if uh, they've get, regained their voice, they may be in a sort of confusion about, is it okay to have my adolescent girl have a voice of her own, which I didn't have and had to recover it later, Right. Would I do that, or is that like bad mothering or something like that? I mean, not only that, maybe maybe there are fears and concerns about, you know, if I help my daughter find her voice, what are the implications in terms of her finding a shidduch? And I mean, I think that there's all kinds of larger ramifications that also need to be considered in terms of, you know, what are the fears, what are the concerns, you know, what would happen, you know, mm -hmm. if... I allowed my daughter to really have her own her own voice, her own thoughts, and express them. Because I imagine what happens when there isn't a place to express those things. I imagine for a lot of girls, those things exist inside. You know, they're, they're there. Maybe they're not fully aware of them. They're not fully conscious, but they're there. Mm -hmm. But but they don't come out because there isn't a place for them to come out. And right. so they may have a very rich inner life, but you know, the, the surroundings, the environment doesn't allow a place for, for the expression of that. Right. So, so that would mean that if we're talking to the mother of an adolescent girl, we might actually have to have a, like this video, a split screen, you know, that she's thinking about herself now with her adolescent daughter and herself as an adolescent. And would she give herself permission? Would she say to herself, for example, about the shit, you know, you can say to yourself, okay, well, how does a um, young woman <clears throat> know after a couple of meetings if it's the right shit, right? That's a huge expectation. And it's mm -hmm. a sort of an expectation of a sort of uh, uh, intuition, which the more voice you have, the less mistakes you'll make. And nobody mm -hmm. wants to doubt if they make a mistake. You know, a shit is a proposition, but um, still, you know, our tradition is that the girl has to feel pretty sure. And how can you feel pretty sure if you're not pretty sure about yourself? So it may be that um, uh, it's in favor of the shida to, to be able to say, listen, you, the, the more you can know who you are, and I'm helping you to know who you are by talking about what it's like to be you. That's who you are, what it's like to be you. And the more that you know that, that will help you when you say to yourself, this is right for me, because the me is clearer, or this is not right for me, and you're more sure that it's not right for you, so we can go on. Because in the middle, you get you know, sort of a muddle, and the results are not necessarily good if it's a muddle. Yeah, and, and, you know, I think that that's very, very true. You know, I think that, and I think that that piece that you're saying right now is actually something that let's say mothers could hear. And from that place, I think. Because they themselves experience. went through that experience. And yeah. because they want to help their daughters be able to get to that point where they would be able to know, is this the right shidduch or is this not the right shidduch? And mm -hmm. in order to know that, they have to know themselves well enough to know what they want, what they need. Um, right. And from, from that place, I think, that, you know, when we're taking Haredi society into consideration, I think from that place, that's a place that mothers could definitely hear, you know, why it's so important for them to help their daughters find their voice and, and how that can help them, you know, in terms right. of the big picture. 
It, it probably is a range, and I'm not an expert in it. I'm not, maybe you have more experience. It's probably a range within the different Haredi communities about how much that would be considered to be very important or something that you don't want to touch. Right. Uh, I, don't, I don't have a huge amount of experience in terms of the different communities, but I think that's probably pretty accurate because in some communities there's very little, you know, I mean, sometimes in some of the Hasidic communities, I, I, from what I've heard, they only meet once or twice and, and then they have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different kind of, uh, kind of experience. Right. I mean, it's interesting because the, the actual expression for the basis of the girls having a right to have a say is Nishalit Biha. Biha is her voice. So that the more that she has her own voice, the more secure everybody is and probably the better the results will be. But so the interesting that you say that, see, I would have thought exactly the opposite, but you raise an interesting question that maybe when you talk about the Shidduch, that's a place where a woman can understand the developmental needs of her daughter developing who she is, because that's who she's going to be under the chuppah. She's not going to be somebody else. And uh, <coughs> she had the same experience herself of having to know or guess or use intuition. And so it creates a kind of a, a special developmental empathy uh, for and the community. I, uh, huh? and I, said, I think that from a cultural perspective, that's a place that a mother in the Haredi community could very much hear that. I, mean, I think that that is a, being very culturally sensitive in terms of this is the reason it's so important for your daughter to find her voice. Right. And, you know, because this is such a critical decision that she's going to have to make that if she doesn't have the ability to know, you know who she is and what it is that's important to her, then she won't know. She won't be able to make that decision or won't be able to make a good decision. Right, right. That's interesting. So uh, that might be a place where a therapist, particularly a woman therapist, could uh, connect in uh, dealing with the differentiation within the, uh, because differentiation is what you need, knowing who you are to be able to make a choice. And uh, now let, let, let me ask you uh, some more questions. You see, we're talking about intersubjectivity. We're talking about, we're talking about families that are easier to work with, right? But the, the coronavirus um, and all signs of crises push people down. In other words, uh, um, there's a lot of uncertainty. You know, if, if you follow the press or you don't follow the press, you hear so many different opinions that contradict each other that you really don't know um, what to do. You really don't know who to believe. You don't know if tomorrow is going to be better or worse. And so um, um, that that kind of uncertainty, I think, tends to lower the level of differentiation. People want to just survive. They don't see it as a time to grow. They see it as a time to survive. And then uh, these kind of conversations that we're having in, in some families, they would be considered, you know, like, oh, you know, this is uh, just be quiet, take care of the kids. We have to get through this. And uh, um, you see that the... Um, the level of differentiation is uh, is lower. People are sort of driving each other crazy because they're regulating each other. They're forcing each other into different roles. They're saying this has to be this way, this has to be that way. How are you experience it? Give me a break. You know, this is, this is what we're doing in a crisis. Is how you experience it? So, you know, with the higher differentiated families, how you experience it is is uh, highlighted in a in a crisis. Right, it's an opportunity to say, "How are you doing?" That's probably, you know, if you think about maybe your own family. You know, people are saying, "And how are you doing with the crisis?" They're asking you how you're doing. <clears throat> so it's a differentiated question. People are looking for appropriation, but with lower differentiation, where that's not so possible, um, I think that the crossroads pushes towards shut up. You know, that's just just do things. We're not, it, how it is to be Avigail actually is of no interest to anybody right now. What Avigail did when she changed the diaper, or didn't change the diaper, that's, uh, or played with the kids or didn't play with the kids, and they were quiet, that's what we want to know. So uh, then the question comes in family therapy, which is a, a, a crucial question for us as therapists. 
to be differentiated, we need to know what role we have, right? And if the role we have is to say, let's talk about how it is to be Abigail, and that's not my role, they're not interested in that. They're not giving me that. I can't help them in that way. So then the question is, what do we do with a family that's in crisis and the differentiation is sinking? Uh, well, the first thing is to help the parents regu emotionally regulate themselves because they can't, they can't be there for their kids and they can't emotionally regulate their children if they can't emotionally regulate themselves. Right. And that's, that's the first step. And obviously, you know, the more emotional regulation there is, then the more differentiation there is. You know, I mean, the more that parents can calm themselves, not get reactive, the more they can be there in an emotionally open way to their children. Um, you know, and, and obviously at times of crisis, parents who already have a, have a hard time with emotional regulation are gonna, you know, be much less regulated. Right. Uh, and you know, I mean, I just had a phone call with a parent uh, yesterday, phone session for an hour, and she's stuck home with four adolescents. She's a single parent, a lady woman, and she's like, you know, already going crazy. You know, the kids are going at each other, they're yelling, screaming, and and you know, I helped her basically make order in her own mind and help calm herself. And she now can go back into the house and like feel like she can like hold it together so that she doesn't react to their to her kids and then she can create a more calm you know environment in the home uh, because however she's coping is more more or less you know going to be how the kids are coping I mean the more that she can hold it together and be calm the more that the kids are gonna be in that in that space the more reactive she's going to get, the more reactive they're going to get. That's, uh, that's for sure. Now, uh, there are some families who, in times of crisis, will, I think, tell us um, our role is to give them orders. How to do it. In other words, uh, let's say that a mother and an adolescent girl are at loggerheads about um, how much she should help the kids or not help the kids. And it's a regulation question. It's a power struggle. It's a question of what what to do. And uh, as you you know know, we therapists don't like questions like that. And we'd rather you know know how you feel. But there are families who say, out the window with how you feel. That's you know for somebody else. Um, what do we do? What do we do? And there, um, I think it's useful to think about how to. Um, how to work with those kinds of regulatory families, lower differentiation at that moment families, in order to help them to uh, um, ricochet back from lower differentiation. In other words, to get themselves. So we try to say, look, let's try to be intersubjective. And they say intersubjective, what are you talking about? You know, things have to get done. So if we jump into things have to get done, in other words, we allow ourselves a role as a um, expert, the only question is, can we give uh, um, help as an expert in a way that raises differentiation? There's an interesting paradox there, because and it's it's an important uh, area I think for crisis management because uh, crisis management a lot of times means what to do, and uh, um, therapists are worried that if we the therapists also goes into what to do, then we'll only deal with regulation. And we will sort of give up on the understanding. And I don't think it has to be that, that, that way. But, uh, you know, I sort of wanted to chat with you a little bit about some ways that we can um, be, take the role that we're being asked, you know, how much should this daughter do, right? Um, and make it into a platform for, you know, to getting enough regulation to allow for um, more into subjectivity after the regulation. In other words, uh, so the, the classic way of doing it is say regulate yourselves, but there will be some families who say, I'm not the problem. She's the one who's mouthing off at me that she doesn't want to take care of the kids. What are you talking to me about? I'm fine. She's the problem, right? The girl is there. And so we have a, uh, a different role. So then the, the question is, how could we think about um, that other role as a way that's not destructive, but that answers the 
the level of uh, uh, the role that we're being given, which is to give an answer. You have some thoughts? Yes. Uh, do you want me to continue? Um, yeah, no, so I think that um, oftentimes, you know, oftentimes we hear from our clients, just tell me what to do. And, you know, that's kind of like trying to like put us into that role, which obviously, you know, we don't want to get into. Um, but I think that there are times where it is important to take a more active role. And I think, you know, in, in the kind of situations you're describing, I think part of what we can help parents and adolescents do is to learn how to enter negotiations. You know, like, you know, this is part of being a, being a parent of an adolescent means you have to learn how to negotiate. It's no longer do this and your kid's going to automatically listen to you and do everything you want them to do, right? And so that's a new role for parents, right? But by opening these kinds of conversations between parents and adolescents, first of all, there's more of a likelihood that the adolescent will feel heard by the parent and, you know, they'll be able to say what they want to do, what they don't want to do and allow them to gain skills so that they can at least be in conversation with each other in a different way. And oftentimes from that place, adolescents become like they dig in their heels less because the minute they feel heard by their parents, then they're more likely to maybe not absolutely do everything their parents are asking, but they're willing to at least take a step towards their parents. Right. And I think that we can facilitate these kinds of interactions between parents and adolescents, and I think it's a, it's a really important role for us to play. Right. So that, that would be what I see as sort of a middle level of differentiation, where you, what you're talking about is that our role is to be sort of the uh, stage managers and to say to the girl and to the mother, talk, you know, well, let's keep other people out of it. And uh, once you finish yelling at each other, try to talk a little longer, you know, like Venusian would, uh, would say, okay, you usually fight for, how long is a fight? Two and a half minutes, fight for two and a half minutes, and then another half a minute. And so something new happens. And if they give us that role, that's a role that they give us of saying, look, it's important for you two to talk, and we're gonna help you to talk, and uh, um, then if that works, then we've known what our role was, and um, they've talked and they've created something with a fight, you know, it didn't start into subjective, but something happened that uh, was, as you say, negotiated, but in the negotiation, which is, as it were, regulation, it's all about what hours you're doing this and that, the way that the negotiation takes place is uh, something that's, uh, that's new. We don't have to say that it's new, but something is happening in the room. So um, that would be a sort of a, a middle level of differentiation. People are saying, don't tell us how we're feeling. Tell us what to do. And you say, well, you figure it out. I'll help you, but do it yourselves. I'm the stage manager. But there will be some families who say, I'm going to talk to her in the room with you. But tell me what to do. That's not what I mean. I'm, we have this girl who doesn't want to do what I what I want her to do and tell me what to do. And so that's a somewhat lower level of differentiation, but there'll be families like that and they'll be challenging. And the more that you're dealing with the Corona crisis, the more that some families who weren't always that way will feel like, first of all, tell us what to do in times of crisis. And there, I think that it's possible if, if we think about how we want to, uh, to manage it, that it's possible to give directions in a way that raises differentiation. Um, and uh, sometimes adolescents like it, you know, because they say, I can't negotiate. That's, that it's beyond what we can do in this family at this point. Don't tell me to negotiate, I'm gonna fail. Do something for me, but not, in, for me, but not instead of me. You know, for me in a way that it pushes me into a different place. So let's say, for example, that the mother and daughter are arguing about her role. And you say, um, uh, I have a solution. Well, that sounds good. You say, oh, <laughs> finally, a therapist who understands what we're here for. Tell us what the solution is. And so then you create a solution that, that forces a, a different kind of process. That would be like what we used to call strategic therapy. I don't know whether people except me still uh, use that. Do you still use that sometimes? Um, less, less so. I mean, I'm familiar with it, but it's less my, my style. It disappeared with um, the, mom the moment narrative appeared on the stage. It uh, wiped everything else out. 
that I'm not sure that all people can do narrative work. Um, mm -hmm. Some people need something first. Everybody has a narrative, but not everybody has access to the narrative. So, um, uh, so let's say that, uh, that I say to the, uh, the mother and the daughter, here's what I think you should try. So I've already changed it, right? I've changed it from what's correct, you know, to, from, you know, what's worth trying. Here's what I think you should try, and you should try it for a week, and then we'll see how it works. So we're already into a situation, I'm, I'm the boss here, but what I'm doing is creating an experiment. So they're both participating. And then let's say that the mother says, um, I want her to do the whole morning <clears throat> with, um, with the children. And the girl says, I don't want to spend any time with the children. I need to sleep, I'm, you know, whatever. So um, you say, well, here's the thought that I had. Monday, well, that's Sunday, it's Israel. Sunday, you do the children. Monday, you don't. Tuesday, you do the children. Wednesday, you don't. And um, then we'll, because, uh, you know, undoubtedly you're both right. And so we'll split the, uh, um, um, the process. And that way we'll learn what's right about you doing the children and what's right about you not doing the children. That, that's absurd, right? It's absurd. But if we say it seriously, it's possible for the family to then say, that's absurd, right? And when they say that's absurd, then you say, well, you probably can figure out something better between you. you see, so then uh, we've taken the role and we've used it in a way of trying to push towards their, does that make sense to you? Or does that seem like, an, um, some people see that as a manipulation. Well, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, like the paradoxical kind of interventions that used to be made. I, I don't have a lot of experience with them, and I think you, it has to fit your personality as a therapist to be able to do it. So it hasn't really been my, my way of working with it, because I, I, mean, I think it can be very effective, but... You think it could be effective with, with families that you've seen? What was that? I think it could be effective with families that you've seen. Yeah, I think especially with very difficult families that nothing else seems to move them. I think it definitely could shift something, but I think, you know, it always has to be very well thought out and you have to figure out exactly how you're going to present it in a way that, you know, that, that, that works or that, you know, or they look at you like you're crazy. So, you know, but, right. but not everybody, not everybody can do those kinds of interventions. Right. See, I, I think, think, you know, at the time of crisis, it's probably worth people being a little bit more available to those kinds of interventions because mm -hmm. people are sort of uh, um, more stressed out and needing, you know, the same way that, you see, we're talking about uncertainty, right? Mm -hmm. So the virus is uncertain and the government is uncertain and everything that Ms. Radabriot says tomorrow is the opposite. And, you know, they, 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 they're doing tests, they're not doing tests. They ordered the test, they stopped doing the test. There's more cases. How are there more cases if they're not doing tests? You know, if, they're not, if they're doing tests, so is it more cases or just more tests? Any, any thoughtful person knows that there's a lot of uncertainty. And uh, so then when they come to a therapist, they want certainty, right? Now, um, the role of being certain, of course, we're not certain. We know that, right? So there's an interesting uh, uh, issue, which is sort of an adolescent issue, which is how do you play with reality? How do you play with reality? Now, uh, as you know, children don't play with reality. They play. And play is the place where you don't ask if it's uh, real or uh, imaginary, but like the shmata that the baby uses to, to and doesn't say, is it? Ashmata, or is it my mother, right? Because the minute you ask what it is, you're not in the transitional zone, right? Mm -hmm. So it has to be that you don't ask that question. You don't ask the question. But um, uh, so, so children, uh, you know, do that sort of thing in, in their play. But adolescents, um, what do adolescents play with, right? In other words, where's the place for play when you're out of the dollhouse? And the answer is usually not in reality at all. Watch a movie, right? Or read a book and imagine things, right? But what's going on at home is a drama. Drama is a form of play, 
right? <laughs> and it's a, it's a drama that may not have been chosen and that maybe the family feels we have to play it, but we don't know who wrote it, right? And uh, um, if you're in it, it feels like it has to be that way, right? And uh, now, has to be that way connects with what, you know, those of us who still use, use those terms call the schizoid paranoid position, which is it is what it is, right? You know, sometimes parents say, is yesh? Uh, somebody knows mayesh? We don't know what, but you say it, you know, so then there's nothing you can do about it. But if you say to yourself, um, okay, we're doing this thing, let's play with the script. You see, because then, you, you, so what am I doing as an expert? I'm playing the expert. The problem with the, with, with the avoidance of the paradoxical position is that people believe that they're the expert. Well, in Italy, when they made it up, nobody had that kind of thought. That got crazy when we got to America, that the expert actually knows something. The whole idea was that, yes, well, you see what's happening in Italy based on this now, but, uh, um, and it started in Milano. But uh, if you play with the expert, you bring them into the play. In other words, you say, here's how I play with reality. Say, hey, here's my thought. This is what, you know, if I'm going to be the expert, mm, here's the expert. It could be good or bad. It doesn't really matter. The, uh, the main thing is that it puts something on the table that somebody has said with certainty. So we can move from absolute uh, anxiety and, and, and uncertainty to something that's clear. But it's a step that's supposed to make the other step. You know, that if I do this, that's to enable you to do something else. It's not to manipulate you. I don't know what you're going to do with it, but it'll sure move you in some way. You see what I mean? Does that make sense to you? Um, say, say more about it. Right. More about the playing in adolescence also. So an adolescent, when we say to an adolescent in the family, um, your family is the way the family is, right? See, for example, uh, adolescent boys, uh, school-age boys in, in Israel say, actually. They don't say, actually. They say, actually. What does that mean? That there's this perfect whole parent. That's how latency kids, school age kids, see their father or their parent as perfect. Why? Because that's what they need. Well, they want to be in the hands of a nine year old. It's pretty scary. So they need to be in the hands of somebody who's a whole uh, person who's uh, complete. Now, um, um, when you start to see what's incomplete about your parents, which is around 12 or 13, and you're able to say, um, listen, there's my mother, and my mother is made of certain aspects, right? But I'm holding together, this is Piaget, this is, you can hold together the notion that this is a whole person who's made out of aspects. Both of them mm -hmm. exist at the same time. You have to be 12 or 13 to do that. So then you can say, she could be different. She could still be mother, but she could stop telling stupid jokes or she should stop screaming, or she, and she could still be her. So in other words, you take the puzzle, which was whole, you take it apart into pieces, and then later you put it back together again. That's what adolescents do. And when they do that, they, uh, they're involved in a process of mourning. You know, Anna Freud used to describe the face of an adolescent as Tisha Buff. She didn't say Tisha Buff, but you know, why do you look like you're mourning? And the answer is because I'm mourning the parent that I just killed. Mm -hmm. Build how well that's what you that you took it apart. That's what mourning is. You take the whole thing, you take it into pieces. But what about the whole thing? You've lost it. You're never going to have it again. That whole person that you can rely on. So you're sort of mourning that uh, that person. There are people who think that you really can't do complete mourning until you finish adolescence, because adolescence is sort of a uh, preparation for mourning. So now here we have this adolescent girl who um, needs to have her mother be imperfect and is mourning the fact that her mother is imperfect, right? So um, we have something that isn't, you can't solve. You can't solve it right now. And then if you add that when you deal with fantasy, which is mother is whole, and reality, which is that she's not, so how do you work with fantasy and reality? And the answer is play. 
right? So adolescents, a lot of times in the drama in their family, this girl who's saying, I'm not gonna do the kids this morning, right? She's, um, she's in an interesting position. She can't play with reality. She's, it's either um, I do the kids and it's reality, or I can't do the kids, which is sort of a fantasy because it's not gonna happen, right? And there's no meeting in, in that drama. So when you start to play with the drama, you allow it to become something that isn't in the transitional zone. In other words, when you say, oh, here is what the expert's gonna say. So first of all, you don't sound like such an expert, right? Yes, but you know, I'm, let me try to be the expert that you want. Here, here's, so you, what, how about Sunday and Monday? That would be a first thought of an expert. So then the whole drama is playful, right? Because my role is playful and I'm getting them into, a lot of times people laugh. Some of the problems with doing this kind of work is that you have to keep your own, you know, because it cracks you up a lot of times. Uh, there we go. But uh, um, if you do that, then you allow the mother and the daughter to do something that's more playful. And uh, um, one of the things that sometimes is missing in family therapy, you know, when we get into either we, we're stuck with the regulation and uh, 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 it's pretty grind, you know, or we are off with uh, the feelings and doing it to subjectivity. In the middle, there's something called play. And uh, um, I think that the, you know, the strategic and the paradoxical uh, ways of working are something that allows for play. And if you look at the coronavirus, and you look and see what people are doing with it on the internet, a lot of it's playful, a lot of it's humoristic, a lot of it, that's, it's an important coping mechanism with things that you say, with, this virus is reality or is fantasy, what is it? Well, let's play with Corona. Let's play with how we play with, uh, does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I was thinking about what you were saying about, um, the, the adolescent having to take a part in the ideal role of the parent, you know, and then make, really go through a mourning process, which I think is very true. But first of all, that mourning process I think is critical because if they don't go through that mourning process, there isn't room for them to discover who they are. So the, the two things I think go very much hand in hand. Right. Um, but, but they can't really destroy the parent. And I mean, like Winnicott says, you know, like, like, it's important that, that the adolescent doesn't destroy the parent. You know, I mean, on one hand, they have to, maybe like what you're saying, you know, realize that their parent isn't perfect. But at the same time, you see adolescents, oftentimes adolescents with behavioral problems, who continue to have behavioral problems in order to get what they need from their parents because their parents aren't giving them what the adolescents are saying, you know, I deserve this, I need this. And, and so, like they can't really fully destroy the parents, you know, because if they fully destroy the parent, what's left for them, you know? So it's kind of, there's that tension there that exists. Right. The, the famous 15-year-old uh, girl who wins the argument with her mother, slams the door, lies down on the bed and cries. Because <laughs> I just want to fight with my mother. So who's my mother? You know, I want to fight with her. I need a mother who doesn't. So it's, it's not solvable in, uh, in reality. That's, that's the place where the, uh, uh, I think that sometimes a, a more playful approach, sometimes people in therapy think that it's disrespectful. But, you know, child therapists, that's what we do. We, we play. And when you play, things happen that don't happen when you don't play, right? Because play is a place where you become whole because the part of me that's fantasy and the part of me that's reality now becomes one if I stop asking that question, right? So in some ways to create uh, the drama or to, to notice the playful part of the drama is something that then makes it possible to move on because that's the point of therapy, to, to, uh, to, to move on and uh, to be able to uh, think. You know, when we think of mentalizing, mentalizing is after all, not what it is, but what it could be, right? That begins with, instead of reality, it is, it is, it is, it's what it could be. That's what's up here. And so the therapist takes the lead. He says, here's what it could be. 
It doesn't have to be right. It just has to be something that makes some sense and uh, can can move things along. Because one of the one of the the uh, the real challenges of adolescence is not to lose mentalization, right? In other words, the every guy who loses her voice stops mentalizing. She accepts things as they are, and then she stops creating her world as it could be. So um, it's it's an important developmental milestone, and we want to keep it alive, right? And, uh, you know, even let's say if we say that to Abigail, well, it could be um, every other day, it could be every two days, it could be every three days. Well, the, the content is nonsense, right? But the could be, the could be is mentalizing, it could be is a process. And sometimes when you bring that into the room, because mom gave you the role as an expert. So you get a little bit of, if you, if you say, oh, no, I don't know, we just have to work through this, you know, into subjective stuff and let's just give me a break. Say, oh, I'm the expert. Here's what the expert does. <laughs> and then the expert plays. And then that allows the, uh, the family to become more playful, which supports the, the, the mentalization as part of the, uh, um, the, the adolescent process that mom and her mother are trying to, uh, to keep alive. But oftentimes adolescents don't want to play with their parents. <laughs> no, well, the thing, they don't want to play with their parents, but they don't realize they are all the time. It's a drama. I mean, adolescence is high drama. The question is which drama, right? So you can play with the drama in some way. Uh, do you have some more thoughts about the adolescent girls and their mothers in the Haredi world? Um. You know, the one thing that comes to mind are the girls who rebel. Yeah. And the, the implications, especially I think in the Haredi world, what it means to be a rebellious girl. Because there isn't always a lot of room to rebel. Mm -hmm. if, you do, if you do rebel, the consequences are quite extreme. Rebel um, means you stop being from. Not even. I'm not even talking about stopping being from. I'm just saying you don't go according to whatever you know the expectations are. Say no. Uh, no, no, we should. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've worked with girls who who left the Haredi community, who you know stopped becoming from already from a very. I have worked with one young woman from a very young age who had a very, very turbulent adolescence. And um, the extreme that she had to go to in order to separate was so extreme, shockingly extreme, in terms of her at-risk behaviors, that I'm not sure if she would have been in a non haredi family that she would have had to rebel to this extent. Um, and so in some ways, I think Haredi girls who do rebel and don't fit the box are probably at an even higher risk than girls who are from non Haredi families. Mm -hmm. Do you have yeah. some ideas about some experience about what helps in those situations? Well, if you're talking about a girl who's, you know, deciding not to be from, depending on the family, obviously, but in many situations, she has to leave home. You know, oftentimes she ends up literally having to leave the house. And, you know, if she can hold it together until the time she's 18, then there's more options for her. But before the age of 18, the options are very limited in terms of, you know, who can help her, where she can go. Meaning, you know, if her family isn't willing to keep her at home, if she stops becoming religious, it, it, she can end up on the streets very, very easily. Um, oh, so, oh, yeah. What was that? It becomes all or none. Everything. Yeah, I mean, not in all families, but in some families, yeah. Um, and, and I think in some ways the risk factors for her as a, as a girl, as a teenage girl being on the streets are much greater than for even many of the boys. Yeah. Um, so that's like one thing that comes to mind. Um, and even just in terms of the girls who don't go to that extreme, but who 
for whatever reason, you know, aren't willing to fit the box, aren't willing to, you know, go according to what the expectations are. You know, I think the threat of, you know, you're not going to get a good shidduch and what's going to happen to you is always there in the background. Yeah. And the ramifications, not just for her, but for all of her siblings. And, you know, it's not just her personally, it's what will happen to her siblings if, you know, if she doesn't tow the party line. And yeah. I think that, that 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 is something that's unique to the Haredi community. I think that doesn't exist to the same extent in other populations that I've worked in. Yeah. And um, it has an impact, I think, on, you know, on, on many things and on, you know, how much room do I have to figure out what's right for me, you know, in comparison to all the external expectations that I'm experiencing. Right. Right. Well, those are the those are the cases that we don't play with. Huh? Those are tragedies, and the um, therapist is uh, hard put not to take sides. Obviously, it's easy for the therapist to take the side of the girl and say that her no is an, a courageous act, or that it's a demand on the family to change something that needs to be changed. Um, but that's not so easy, um, and. Um, a lot of times, I think, a uh, therapist is hard-pressed to say, look, this is a connection, which is bleeding, but it's a connection. These, these, is, this, these are, who you are is your family. And, um, uh, you know, Bowen would say, uh, cutting off isn't going to solve anything. Uh, that's true if it's permanent, but a uh, therapist sometimes, as you say, may say, look, we need to take a break from each other so that the sides can heal. And it may take a couple of years, it may go past adolescence, but in the therapist's mind, that's the mentalization, you know, what it might be um, if we try to hold something about the connection, you know, that uh, um, the parts of it that have been positive, that have been uh, loving in this connection, we would hope that it might come back together in mm -hmm. some way at some time. And sometimes an adolescent girl needs to hear that on the way out because it mm -hmm. allows her to, no one else is telling her that. Everybody else is saying, you're leaving. And the therapist may say to her, you're right now, you're doing something because that's all you can do. And right. that's, uh, it may change. Right, right. Uh, my experience is that those kids, you know, are very high risk for substance abuse, for sexual promiscuity, for, Ending up on the streets, meaning those are the kids that we really, really, really have to worry about as a society because right. they really don't have a whole lot of options. I mean, other than ending up in, you know, Kimia or, you know, some kind of institution, which oftentimes they're not willing to go to, anyways. Um, but those yeah. are the kids that. It's that a social challenge, isn't it? In other words, uh, this family cannot hold together family and the culture, let's say. Um, and uh, then one of the challenges is, does the culture make more room to make these tragedies less, uh, um, less severe, less dangerous? Or does the culture see that the culture providing, uh, uh, protecting itself uh, can't make more room? And these are the, uh, uh, this is the fallout and the, uh, the price of it. Obviously, therapists tend to think more in the first way, but you know, we'd like to see if we could find a way to help the culture to see that at the edges, instead of people uh, being at such enormous risk, which has, you know, in Haredi culture, Pikuach Nefesh is in Haredi culture too, that there's something that needs to be done to try to uh, reduce the risk. Um, but how you do it without compromising on your cultural values those of us who are not Haredim are in danger of applying some sort of uh, outside way of thinking. And it needs to come from inside. And uh, one of the reasons I think why we're trying to create Haredi family therapy is so that Haredim can think from the inside, both of the culture and of family thinking, and create those things that are uh, not yet there.
Right. And there are there are organizations within the Haredi community that are addressing you know these the at risk. There are things that are happening, and I think you're right. I think ideally it has to come from within the community. Um, you know, I mean, some of these kids leave that world completely and don't want to have anything to do with it. So you know, they're looking for for resources outside the community. You know, they've shut the door behind them and left and said, "I'm not going back there." Um, yes, those those kids need resources. They're outside of the community, yeah. but um, you know, but but the risk factors already start really before adolescence. You know, I mean, it's not by the time they get to be thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. We're talking usually a few years before already is when some of those you can already begin seeing some of those risk factors. That's why early intervention is so important. Right. right. Of, it, it, when you're dealing with an adolescent, when you've already gone pretty far along, you may not have a whole lot of uh, leverage. It may not be possible to solve certain things in a way that you imagine. That if we had done this 10 years ago, if there might have been. But, you know, they're also it's big families. So a lot of times you think about the rest of the family and the girl, and it's a, it's a, it's a heartache. It's a heartache. <laughs> And today, you know, from what I understand, I mean, I work with adolescents, with families of adolescents. You know, adolescence today begins oftentimes by the age of 10 or 11. You know, we're not even talking 13, 14. You know, adolescence has already begun at a much, much younger age, both physiologically and emotionally. Um, there may be true less in the Haredi community than in the non-Haredi community, but the age has definitely dropped. Right. In terms of what we're saying. Challenges and the developmental challenges have changed also. You can't wait till 50, right? No, no, it's much, much, much earlier than that. Okay. Listen, Aviva Zahavi Asa, I want to uh, thank you very much for uh, taking the jump and being the first <laughs> to uh, try to experiment with this, uh, um, this kind of uh, uh, conversation. And um, it, this won't be the last, but it was the first. So thank you okay. very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye.